It is my pleasure to introduce Linda Kelly uh, of Cryo, CryoCell down in Tampa, Florida. I had the pleasure to tour their lab this summer and I was very impressed with it and very impressed with the way Linda is running it and with the way David and his brother are remaking the company. And she is going to talk about a topic which I think is really important and doesn't get enough attention, which is the stability of the kits in which we ship cord blood so that it gets to the lab with the cells alive. Thank you, Fran. Okay, so the title of my talk is The Impact of Time and Temperature During Non-Frozen, i.e. Liquid, Cord Blood Transportation and Storage. So cord blood banking is becoming a global business, and even if your business is just in the United States, we are forced with a very extreme temperature range from about minus 15 to 30 degrees centigrade where samples are being collected. So regardless of where you're located, the samples could come from any of these um, areas, frequently being shipped to a centralized processing facility, which sometimes is at a great distance. Um, where all of the testing and the processing and the storage occurs. And even if you are partnering with a medical courier, there are many opportunities for temperature fluctuation as shown here. So what are these opportunities? Well, it depends on, uh, in some respects, on the geographic and seasonal variations, but certainly um, in the courier's car, in the trunk of the car, where temperatures can get up to as high as 78 degrees C, which is 172 degrees Fahrenheit um, at the courier's holding facility. So if they don't um, have a direct route to the airport, can't keep it in their car, they may have a holding facility at some place. Um, there's the airport holding facility, of course the airport tarmac, and then finally the uh, airplane cargo compartment. Many of our couriers, almost all of them, are using um, the national um, uh, airline uh, services, and many of those have varying um, different models of airplanes that they use, and therefore the cargo departments um, can can vary. So I'd like to point out some data uh, from a study, in this case it was done by Van Zant et al. It was published in 1983, but this study represents a wide body of data published now that demonstrates the adverse effects of heat on stem cells. In this particular study, the investigators looked at the effect of heat on um, murine bone marrow derived CFUs, CFU gem, CFU M, BFUE, and CFUE. And what they demonstrated was that um, progenitor cells exposed to 37 degrees, shown here, in each of these cases, um, had very little adverse effect on the survival of the progenitor um, cell. However, exposing those cells to uh, temperatures as low as 42, 43, and 44 degrees centigrade for even short periods of time, um, 30 minutes could adversely affect the survival of those cells. So heat is not a good thing on um, the survival of stem cells, neither is freezing, but I'm gonna focus the uh, conversation today on heat. Okay, so what do the regulators say about how we should be uh, keeping these cells, uh, what temperature we should be keeping them at during transportation? Well, um, there's a guidance document published by the FDA in 2009, which recommends that um, uh, cord blood units that are in the liquid state be stored between 15 and 25 degrees C, or at an acceptable temperature that has been validated to maintain equivalent product quality. So most of us use four to 30 degrees. And then importantly, recently, uh, in the fifth edition of the NetCord FACT standards, a new standard is, um, has been added, which requires that 
When a cord blood unit is shipped, the temperature inside the outer container shall be continuously monitored. So we are now all required to put temperature indicators or data loggers inside uh, the kits. This has been standard practice for public cord blood banks. Um, it will now be uh, required for anyone who is fact accredited. So at CryoCell, we were using a variety of different kits. We are an international company. We uh, transport units um, across a, a, a large part of the world. And uh, we looked at our kits to determine if we needed to do uh, some further due diligence. Our international kits were different than our um, domestic kits. Um, in trying to determine um, whether or not we should make changes, we decided to do a very simple internal study. And the first objective was, first of all, to look what uh, was being used in the industry, and we wanted to know um, a spectrum across all different models of cord blood banking in the industry. Then we performed a uh, simple in-house controlled temperature test of the kits that we evaluated. Um, we took the information that we gleaned from that in-house experiment and we designed an improved kit that enhanced temperature uh, control, but very importantly in our industry, it also contained um, cost and that was important to us. We then performed a worst case scenario validation of this new design in an authentic setting to show that it was sufficient. Um, and then finally, we took um, the initiative to identify uh, a medical courier that not only had an exceptional track record and demonstrated commitment to quality, but someone that we could really partner with to uh, do some real-time assessment of, um, of metrics that we wanted to, to measure. Okay, so this is a table that shows the results of our uh, internal testing. And uh, what we did was um, look at cord blood kits from 12 different banks. Um, it turns out that two, two of the banks used exactly this, the same kit. And as I said, we wanted to do a cross-section of all business models. So there were family banks, private banks, as well as hybrid banks, and some public banks. Um, we looked at the dimensions of the kit and the weight. And the, uh, the, the dimensions of the kit really ranged from a simple cardboard box, relatively small, to um, a very substantial cooling unit um, with weights that range from just a pound to 11 pounds. So it was a significant range. We found that um, none of the private cord blood banks included any kind of data logger or data indicator. Um, two of the public banks did include data loggers. And then we, um, and, oh, and I should point out that in uh, even though the business uh, models varied from private to public banks, in all cases, these were kits that were being used uh, to transport units from the birthing center to the centralized processing facility. So they were being used to ship units. Um, when we looked at the insulating materials, we found uh, that they range from absolutely no insulation at all, just cardboard, uh, some polyethylene foam, which really doesn't supply very much insulating capability to polystyrene coolers, to phase change material, to uh, vacuum insulated uh, coolers. So there was really a significant variation in the materials that were being used. So we did a very simple experiment. We took the kits, we packed them up according to the cord blood bank's directions with a data logger inside. We put them into a 37 degree incubator and we just measured how much time it took for the data logger to exceed 30 degrees centigrade. And what we found is that um, the shortest amount of time was one hour all the way up to 78 hours. Um, and it basically broke down 
uh, into the uh, kits that were provided in the uh, family banks um, gave very little protection, one, two, four, or five hours, and the, uh, the kits that were coming from the public banks were providing the maximum protection. So when we looked at this information, we decided that we did want to make some changes to what we were doing. Um, we took some ideas from the materials that were being used, and then we did a lot of research and talked to a lot of uh, different manufacturers in the field. And uh, we came to an important conclusion. We clearly thought that the lower level of protection, we knew that that wasn't sufficient. But um, although it would be admirable to go for, uh, for the gold, we also knew that that was going to be very costly and we really questioned whether or not it was going to be necessary to have that kind of protection for our business model. So what we came up with is shown here. We came up with a kit that um, is about 12 inches square, so it's a, a little box. Um, it weighs less than five pounds. Um, it does contain a polystyrene cooler, and that cooler is molded, and that turns out to be very important. And it contains um, one and a half inch thick walls. That too turns out to be important. Importantly, we utilized insulating materials that we could purchase off the shelf. They were not custom materials. It's a phase change material, and I'll talk a little bit about that on another slide. When we designed this kit and then did the exact same experiment that we had performed on the from the uh, kits that I showed you on the slide before, we found that we were able to get 46 and a half hours of protection. So that was um, significantly better than um, the lower ranges that I showed you. And it was approaching, but not quite as um, as robust as, as what um, was seen in the the um, gold standards, I would say, from the public banks. Um, we then took, because we were in the process of becoming fact accredited, we took the initiative to include a temperature indicator. Now, fact doesn't say that you have to have a data logger. They just have, you just have to have continuous temperature monitoring. If you can find an in indicator that works, that's sufficient. We did a lot of research on uh, indicators. There are a lot of them out there, and I can tell you most of them don't work. So if you would like some further information, you can see me after and I'll tell you what we're using now. Um, the temperature indicator is oil and water resistant. It's irreversible once it changes color and it will monitor the, temp the whole temperature range in our case from 4 to 30 degrees. And then we took a very simple step and we added the International Air Transportation Association code, um, the IATA code. We put it into our artwork directly onto our kit, which is to give the airport officials a heads up that this is a package that has to be maintained between 4 and 30 degrees. Not foolproof, certainly, but um, it does um, add a little bit of extra insurance. And then you can see here what the kit looks like. It's very uh, user friendly. It's user friendly um, as far as size and weight for the client. It's user friendly for in the delivery room, um, for our sales reps, for, for everyone involved. This just shows you all the material. Here's the phase uh, change packs that we use. Um, I think it's better shown on the next slide. Um, here it is all packed up. This is just a schematic of um, how it needs to be packed uh, within the cooler, the, styro, uh, the polystyrene cooler. All of the materials are, um, I'm sorry, first a phase change material gel pack is put on the bottom. All of the other components are then loaded in and a, 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 another gel pack on top and close it and it's ready to go. So a little bit about the phase change material. It's becoming standard for uh, thermal management in the field. It really is a great solution because they are small, they are, um, they are lightweight, and they provide a lot of, um, of uh, insurance to maintain temperature. As the temperature rises, 
and the material goes from a solid phase to a liquid phase. There is the ability over a wide range to absorb some of the energy and allow the temperature in the, uh, the ambient temperature in the immediate area to remain constant. And it, it also works in the reverse um, if you're going from a hot climate into a cold climate or a cold climate into a hot climate. The key is to find a phase change temperature of your material that is, um, expected that that is your biggest challenge when you're um, shipping something so if you're shipping in the summer or to hot um, destinations you want to uh, have a phase change temperature that may be different if you're in an area where you're thinking that cold is going to be um, your challenge but they're both available Okay, so then what we needed to do is determine whether or not this was going to be sufficient for our business. And I mentioned that we're an international business. Many of our affiliates are in Central America um, and South America. So we did two experiments. Um, we started this process in April, and at that time, we decided to ship to Santiago, Chile, which um, is our furthest destination. The ambient temperatures in those two cities in April were in the um, upper 80s. So we, we did an experiment under those conditions and then waited until the summer when it got even hotter and we did a second experiment um, between Tampa and Puerto Rico where the ambient temperatures were well up into the 90s. And the next slide shows that in the Chile, um, experiment, we actually took the kit, uh, we put a data logger in it, we sent it to our affiliate, said don't open it, um, just send it back, and it went through that process three times. So it went back and forth from Santiago to Tampa three times. It was in transit for uh, something like 17 or 18 days, and when we downloaded the information, this is uh, the upper range 30 degrees, and down here is the lower range. 40, uh, 4 degrees, and you can see that it stayed well within uh, the temperature range that we were interested in. When we did the more rigorous experiment in August, sending it to Puerto Rico, the temperatures were a little higher at that time. It was the same kind of format. We uh, sent it back and forth and back and forth. Uh, and I should point out that um, under these conditions, we simply, we wanted worst case uh, conditions, so we did not use our medical courier, we used FedEx. And even under those conditions, the temperature in both experiments was maintained within our range. So we felt that we had achieved our, our goal. We had a kit that was uh, relatively small and uh, cost effective. Um, and it, it met our needs, um, it more than met our needs. So um, I, I said that I was gonna talk a little bit about what are the time effects on, um, on the samples. Well, again, uh, the NetCord fax standards, the new standards have required that cryopreservation of unrelated cord blood units shall be initiated within 48 hours. Um, they're giving us a little bit of leeway in the private banking, and they have required that cryopreservation of cord blood units um, that are related must be initiated within 72 hours. So for our domestic clients, that's not a problem. For our international clients, it does become a challenge. I would like to point out uh, an experiment that we were able to do. Actually, it wasn't a planned experiment, and it was due to an unfortunate uh, event that occurred beyond our control, where two twins, uh, excuse me, a set of twins were born in Venezuela on uh, July 16th, and for reasons that I, uh, I won't go into right now, one of those units made it to our facility within 89 hours, and the second unit didn't make it until 135 hours. So both of these units were quite old uh, by the time they arrived to us. They were identical twins, uh, born in the same place, obviously, uh, packed up into the same kit, transported by the same courier. We couldn't control all the variables in the experiment, but it did allow an opportunity to determine what the effects of the additional time might have been on the unit. And the important information here is that the TNC, and these, these cord blood units were both of uh, comparable 
volume. One was 80 mils and one was 75 mils. Uh, um, the T and C count of the younger of the two unit was significantly higher. The viability was higher. The CD34 count was almost tenfold higher. The CD34 viability of the younger one was 95%, of the older one, 61%. And the TNC recovery was significantly higher on the younger unit, indicating that the time um, is clearly important. The longer that they are in transit, the, uh, the more compromised the stem cells will be. And then I will just show you that we did a CFU analysis on segments from these. And uh, here's our control. We had robust uh, colonies growing. There were no CFUs grown in either one of those units, despite the fact that one of them had a 95% CD34 viability. So this is a N of one. I don't know um, that we can make any great conclusions, but it is a red flag that time does matter and we need to uh, take that into consideration. My final slide is MNX is our um, our provider for medical courier. They provide us with face-to-face -face, uh, quarterly business review. Um, they, they come to CryoCell, we sit down with the team, we go over in uh, real time the shipments by the service class, the delivery exceptions that have occurred, the transit times, the airline trends, and the cost per shipment, and they um, allow us to make changes uh, rapidly. Um, so, the conclusions. It's really a two-pronged approach that is required to ensure that both time and temperature are consistently maintained during shipping. The first is that the transportation container has to be adequate to provide thermal protection from temperature extremes that cannot be avoided even if you're dealing with uh, a medical courier. Um, we were able to find an off-the-shelf solution with readily available materials. Um, yielding a size and weight that is user friendly and cost effective and that we feel will really in, in enhance the quality of our of our samples the second approach um, does require having a um, a medical courier that is a responsible partner okay and this is it I, I, I passed my uh, acknowledgments. They're all my wonderful colleagues at um, the university, I mean, so, sorry, at CryoCell and also at MNX. But um, this is my final slide saying that it's only going to get worse. <clears throat> <laughs> so I'll be glad to take any questions. Amy. <laughs> so we'll have time for two quick questions. AB Matthew with BioLife Solutions. So um, I think. You know, the work that you've put in, you've obviously then ensured a good shipping option and everything. Does it, is it going to affect your policy at all in terms of if you do see a certain reading on the temperature indicator or anything like that where you would not go ahead and, and bank down or you would turn around and tell the parents, look, we're not going to go ahead with this? Uh, have you correlated any of that or is it still in the information gathering stage? Great questions. We do have to correlate it. I can tell you that um, we have we have changed our policy with the 72 hours. We will not bank anything that comes in after 72 hours unless there is an extreme, uh, you know, reason, a situation. And in order for it to be banked, I have to be personally um, involved in that. In those cases, we are um, we're doing. Uh, significant additional quality testing, CFU analysis, et cetera, and we are informing the clients that um, you know that this this may not be an optimal unit, and giving them good reasons why, and letting them make that decision. In those situations, we are currently paying for all of the processing if they de decide to um, you know to toss it, and we feel that we need to do that. As far as um, monitoring the temperature when it comes in, that's still ongoing. We'll do some evaluation, but uh, it'll be the same thing. If it comes in and if it's out of range, we're going to be doing some additional testing. We're, uh, we're, we're going to focus our efforts on trying to solve the problem, the upfront problem, and, and not have to deal with it you know, at the end. But um, good questions and more to come next year. Quick question about uh, the phase change material. My understanding is a lot of these things require some kind of uh, um, conditioning. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. before they're used. Do you have such a thing built in? Are you required to condition those packs before they are put into use? So preconditioning is um, a value. It does help. But since the... Uh, the temperature range for these is at 21 degrees. The preconditioning is simply keeping them at ambient temperature. So we advise our clients, as everyone does, please don't put these in your car. They should be at room temperature uh, when you pack up the kit. And this is the last question. Hi, Linda. Ed Brindle from Inception Biosciences. Um, uh, very interesting data there, uh, just to show the difference between the, the different kits and the materials. Were you able to look at in your study when you took the live samples or you actually shipped them out to uh, the two locations there, were you able to monitor the external ambient temperature to show the differential between in and out? Yeah, no, we weren't. But we are doing that now with MNX. That's another great um, uh, attribute in partnering with them. So we're starting a study, it's ongoing right now, where they have taken our kits, we've got a data logger inside, and they're putting one on the outside, and we're going to send it by our commercial, any of our commercial carriers, which is all of them, Delta, you know, United, all of them, Southwest, and they will go on designated routes, and we'll be able to do that correlation with the external ambient temperature. Thank you.